Um, yes. Probably just gonna be my promise guy, of course. Yeah. Um, so Forest Blanchery, something actually Larry made up for the city. Something we everyone in the city went through, because we felt we lacked in Forest Blanchery. Something that happened in our job is everyone got off the rigs in, the, in Chicago with what a pick-headed axe and a pike pole for every incident. It'd be a water rescue, someone in the water. Well, guess where they got off the rig with? Pick out an axe and a pike pole. Not like a line or a ladder, what? And a six like foot. Yesterday. Yeah, and a six foot hook, you know, so great. Um, I get the hook to maybe grab someone, but it's only a six foot or whatever. But we had Halligan bars yeah. on our rigs, but no one really understood how to use them and why they would, so they sat in the rigs. Um, Larry and I'm putting a PowerPoint together for the city, which now we're actually teaching with the IFSI and getting out there because it's a really good PowerPoint of Force Country. Not just about the Halligan, but Force Country itself. Um, we were here yesterday. Um, I'm the cornerstone regional rep. It's a regional, uh, it's a cornerstone class. It's a free class to your department for those that are attending. And uh, it went well. I work in Chicago, been there 13 years. Started out as a volley in the suburbs, was there for about seven, and worked part time in North Palos for a little bit. Um, signed the squad five. And um, this class has helped me with my job in my department. You guys with me today? Uh, Larry McCormick, I started as a volley in 95. Um, got a job in Oklahoma. New York City, I'm fireman in Harlem in a ladder company. I uh, got assigned to an Inglewood truck company in Chicago and been a detail to Squad 5 for uh, seven years. I'll be in my seventh year. But, uh, yeah. Um, I'm Matt Bird. I don't have as great of a story as these two, but uh, it's all I, work smoking in, here. I work in Flossmore. I started in the fire service in 2000. I got here full time in uh, 2006. He won't talk much. He's, he says he's all skilled, so you'll see him really <laughs> shine when we get down to the doors. All right. Uh, just, yeah, yeah, on that note, Rich, <laughs> not, not that I know anything about nothing, but um, this PowerPoint, uh, this kind of thing that Chicago decided to do, we got permission from FDNY, the guys who wrote their force military manual, you, you may have seen in your travels, um, Vigiano and Captain Morris from Rescue One. Uh, one of our retired guys, Pat Lynch, said, hey, we want to do this thing. We're trying to put this thing together. Do you mind if we, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel by any stretch of the imagination. They said, absolutely, go ahead. Just don't make any money on it. So, you know, a lot of it is we, we kind of speak a little chicago ease in this, but, I mean, we're going to give credit where it's due, and it's, it's, um, it came from New York. They have six positions in the truck. One is the officer. They don't count. They have five firemen on the truck. Um, of those five firemen uh, that carry hand tools, the bosses don't carry tools. They're in a separate union. Um, four of them typically carry the Halgen tool. So the Halgen tool to them is the picket axe for us here in the metropolitan area. You know, they're very good at it, okay? It came from there. And again, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We just, you know, thought we'd give them the proper uh, accolade. So um, this is kind of just an awareness level class, uh, more or less. We're not going to kill you with the PowerPoint, guys. We're going to try to move on and get to the hands-on skills because that's where you learn how to do this uh, stuff. So it's labor intensive and it's, uh, again, we're only going to kind of scratch the surface as we go through this. But these are the objectives. We're going to talk about different types of doors, locks, tools, sizing up your forceful entry problems, um, the different techniques, some security problems that are kind of out of the ordinary, and then just some tricks of the trades, um, how to make your life a little bit easier. A couple different types of doors wood, metal, and, and then the different components we're going to talk about, the types of uh, uh, frames they're in, and the swing, which is what's important when it comes to forcing these doors. Wood doors, just like Richie's closing there, you got a hollow core that's, that's probably uh, um, a little bit heavier than a hollow core interior door, pre-hung, like Home Depot door you'd have on a bedroom. Uh, and then there's solid core, which I, don't, I can't tell from here, but um, you might have solid uh, in older parts of town, which you guys have plenty of these a solid uh, wood core door or a panel door which is for exterior application. Um, and here's kind of the rundown. The solid, solid uh, core door, if that was oak, if that was a solid piece of oak, that'd be, Josh, how much would that set you back if that was solid oak? Oh, hundreds and hundreds yeah. of dollars, right? So they're basically, it's a laminated, it's a veneer of oak over some form of solid core. Uh, and then your hollow core is the next one over, that's your pre-hung. Home Depot uh, uh, interior partition door. 
Same thing kind of with the panel. And then as you go that way, you get more south of I-80. We're not all that familiar Arms with the okay. bars and frame and brace and all that stuff. So, but for the mo most part, what, the nuts and bolts of what we do is the solid core, uh, the hollow interior doors are typically not all that challenging. When it comes to forceful entry, we, we, we don't have, uh, you lean on those and they're forced. But then panel doors too, we run into those as well. What's important about the anatomy of all doors is that, again, uh, is this rail or this edge. And when we go to force these things, uh, they're gonna come into play. And you'll see that when we go downstairs, we're gonna sound them uh, and try to get a little bit of a gap. When we strike these doors, you wanna try to hit that rail or, or the frame of it. Because if you go to deviate anywhere away from that rail, um, all that energy you're putting into forcing the door is gonna be absorbed in the door because it's gonna concave the door, not blast the locks off. And, and that'll make more sense when we put our hands on the tool. So, um, again, if, we, if I was gonna force this door and I struck this door anywhere away from this rail or edge, you can imagine what's gonna happen. The tool's gonna go right through. So, and that comes into play with metal doors as well. And uh, different types of metal doors, tubular aluminum, hollow metal clad, uh, commercial rear doors, uh, you guys got them as much as anywhere else. VPS, are you guys, do you guys run into any VPS now? Yeah. Okay, so that's made, VPS was developed here in Chicago at like 45th and Danny. So, you know, we have a fair amount of it. We don't get tons of fire duty in those buildings, but certainly, uh, you know, we do. We get a, a fair amount. So, and this is just a Chicago public high rise door, a PHS door. Um, commercial tubular front door and uh, the hollow a metal or metal clad. Again, they're hollow metal because a solid metal door would weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, the door downstairs and the prop is not, uh, is to one degree or another hollow, um, but that's 400 pounds itself, the, the prop that you guys have. So you can imagine a solid metal door would be pretty, pretty heavy. These are our storefront doors, okay? Not uncommon. Um, you know, a lot of times depending on the, on the run, uh, it's going to dictate how we uh, attack these doors. If it's a control alarm or a waterfall alarm, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get the K tool and pull this lock and pick the lock, right? You guys um, have K tools? No. No. No K tools in the rig? No. No? Someone suggested there's a K tool in the rig. They were mistaken. They were mistaken. Oh, wow, okay. nice. Well, we got a picture of it. Okay. Maybe it'll jog your memory. It's about the K12. <laughs> <laughs> K12, K tool, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, the numbers, yeah, whatever. Whatever it takes. 220, 221. Um, that said, if it was a fire condition, well, naturally we'd probably take the glass, but what are some of the problems with taking that glass? You don't control the air. What's that? You don't control the air. Exactly. We lost control of ventilation. We rode ventilation off. So we, we, we can't shut that door and maybe kind of keep that fire in check anymore or, or limit the amount of, you know, air it's getting. So what else do we do with taking the glass? Debris, right? Glass particles for the holes on across going in. What's the metal thing going across the center? Panic bar or just to push hardware, right? What do you see every YouTube video? Have you ever saw them or see a video online when they break the glass, they duck under that instead of opening a door? You ever see the videos where things go wrong quickly because they can? Condition change, you're trying to bail out. What does every fire get caught up on? That metal bar. And they don't move, they're made to be pushed against, so they're solid. You, if you're gonna take the glass, go in and unlock the door, unless it's a double key and you can't, then take that bar out. Whether you cut it with a hearse tool, a saw, whatever, then take it out. And there's your other option. You're gonna cut the throat with a saw blade between there. There's other options besides just taking the glass. Definitely, it, the saw works great. And you can use a halogen tool to your advantage and that you can get the abs in here pried open and get the saw blade in there. Even if it's covered, you can cut through that. And again, the problem with that is like Rich said, what happens is that bar starts to concave and it makes a confined space. As, you hour, as, a, as I hit this down, Especially if you hit it in the middle, there's deflection in the bar, it'll start to collapse and be, it brings the frame in. So now you made a real tight space even tighter. And that first guy that goes to get out and he gets hung up on his bottle, he's gonna look like Winnie the Pooh, kind of stuck in a tree trunk. And everybody else is gonna have to go over the top. So just like what Rich said, um, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna strike this, go to one side or the other, uh, things fail at connection and, and blast that thing. Get it, just get it out of the way, err on the side of caution. Um, do these doors open towards us or away from us? They open towards us, right? How do we know that? The hinge. The hinge. But more, the, the, the one thing is the hinge. If you see hinges, it, it, unless it's a, uh, like a barn door that goes you know, in and out, 
this is this these doors open for you. Okay. So again, with the metal door, a solid metal door would weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. So there's some kind of solid wood core door. Typically, this might be a wood frame or a metal frame, uh, and then a metal sheeting over it, or metal ribs with a metal frame with a with a metal cover. But again, at the end of the day, all doors had this with this rail, and it, it's kind of important. We'll get into why uh, in a little bit. But the jam construction. So the the the, the lost art of this forcible entry is, um, and I say that because now that we have rabbit tools, guys think like, well, I don't need to know basic firemanship. We've got this rabbit tool, and you know, uh, I don't need to know how to force doors. The rabbit tool is going to do all the work, and and that's fair to say, but. Um, what if there's only one, or what if it's not in service? The problem with the rabbit tool is, when I go to force this door with a rabbit tool, when when you when we're talking about forcible entry, we're defeating the weakest link. Okay, we're always attacking the weakest link. When I when I insert a rabbit tool in here, this stops because it's separate from the one behind the jam, breaks and it fails, and the door's still intact. We didn't we didn't defeat the door yet. Okay, so the lost art of this is getting the the, the force of the tool past the stop around the back side of the jam. And basically what you're creating is a class one lever. Okay, we're creating a fulcrum, all right? Or we're, or we're creating a mechanical advantage. We need to get that tool to the back side of the jam to incorporate a fulcrum. If you don't, if, if the tool's not set, it's not it's not gonna work. And you'll see that when we start playing with this stuff downstairs. So um, a rabbit jam is just, it's a one piece jam. It's what's on your prop downstairs, it's that one. Um, that's a, a, a knockdown frame that's backed up with sheetrock in this case, but it could be backed up with uh, concrete or some exterior door. But that's what you're going to have in, or it could be, um, you could have a bump out here too. Um, but this is a solid uh, rabbit jam, and, and this is the stop to put on afterwards. So it's basically like having a shoe that's put on with brad nails. As soon as you put your, your ads in there to pry it down, that stuff's going to crack off because that's the weakest link. I was kind of full yesterday that, well, we get a door, well, how do we force doors typically here in Cicero? What? Sledgehammer? Or what's what was the other one? Kick or, mule kick? The old mule kick? And what someone said, if you can't get it in one kick, you're a pussy or a sissy <laughs> or so on. Generally, kind of is that true? Oh no, not at all. Not at the kitchen table for sure it is. But it's for chill. the point is, are you going to mule kick the door if you have a halogen bar in your hand? I can see it in a bedroom door that's hollow. And have we done? Have you ever mule kicked the door and you have the halogen bar in your hand? I have. I'm an idiot. And the door's on mine. Doors unlocked. Yeah. We even talked <laughs> about the golden rule. Larry will get to that. But and did you kick it this way? So you maybe you hyperextend your knee, you screw up your knee, or do you turn around and boot kick it that way? Uh, you know, <laughs> point we're trying to get to. We've had guys do it and actually get injured, throw throw out their knee, tear a ligament, pull some, whatever. When they hit bar your hand, I get it. It's a residential home. It's a bedroom door. I get that. But how about your front doors? How about your commercial doors? You're not booting those, and you probably shouldn't. But you get that mindset and mentality. Let me just go and give it a little try. Let me just test it. Don't use the tool, it's there to help you and you'll have more energy to force more doors if need be. So that's what we're trying to get to. And I've, I've done it, I, I, uh, we had some idiot lock, the cops needed to get in this apartment. And I took the halogen tool, I used it as a prop so I could kick the door and I'm beating on the door and I don't have, I've never taken a tie bolt lesson, I got no karate skills. And this door is just, it's winning. And I said, I'm like, what am I doing? So I, I, I just got to the truck, and that's what everybody does in Chicago is kick doors in. So I got no coping skills. So I take the halogen, it was one of these type of jams. All right, I put the ads in, I cracked, the stop cracked, I pulled it off. Now I got a straight shot. I took the tool, and this would never, ever happen again. I, 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 it only, that was my one time. I rammed the tool in, it went down, it went between the door, got to the backside of the jam, and popped it, right? So I'm like, wow, that really went good. That would never, ever happen again. Lightning will never strike twice. And we're walking back to the rig, and my officer said, because he's old school Chicago, he's like, yeah, that door really kicked your ass, huh? And I'm like, shit. You know, here's a guy who's been in a lot of fires, but doesn't understand the mechanics of that halogen tool and why it's, it's uh, you know, it's a fireman's helper. Um, you know, if you're built like me, you're not kicking doors in, especially doors that swing towards us, right? So you have to have plan B. Um, just again, a couple different examples of the, of the, of the jam. This is a, uh, ra a rabbited or a uh, uh, stop jam. So this again, this is separate from the one bar that it's on. This will crack right off. This is a knockdown or a KD frame, um, rabbited in metal, one piece metal. Could be backed up with concrete or it could be backed up with sheetrock. So the swings of the door and why they're important. So the door on top, that's an inward left-hand swinging door. 
Uh, you put your butts in the hinges, it swings locked. Um, that's an inward door, it's recessed. So that's one indication. Um, and here's our firehouse door, it's an outward swinging lock. Okay, this one's flat to the wall. Can you have an outward swinging door that's recessed? And the answer is, is yes. On our new firehouses, all our outward swinging doors are recessed in one course of brick. Okay, and that's important. When we get downstairs, we'll explain why. Because there's certain ways we force this door to, that we teach that works all the time. Not all the time. That should work all the time. Um, and there's another way you could do it. But this door being flat to the wall, sure, we know that it's flat to the wall. But the, 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 the key is here, guys. It's the hinges. Okay, if you see hinges, it, it opens towards you. Doesn't matter if it's recessed or flat to the wall, any, any of that stuff. At the end of the day, if you see the hinges, that door is going to come towards you. And think about it too, as Larry's saying, it's the hinges of the home lawn. If I see, see the hinges on the outside, it swings out. I don't see hinges because they're on the inside, it swings in. Remember that. Even though what Larry's talking about with a door being recessed, the brick opens, if you feel the door in reference to the frame, to the frame, if here's the frame, the door goes into a pocket, it's swinging in. Your hand went into the door. If I ran my hand against that door, my hand goes against the frame, smooth to the door. The door is out with the frame. Does that make sense? Whatever you can remember. You may not see hinges at 2.30 in the morning. You should be able to feel them, or you should be able to feel that drop in, or my hand weren't as smooth. Okay? Now, of course, a brick may be out here, without a doubt, but in reference to the frame and the door location. So this setup could be, this whole setup, this is an old golden fire could be set back in the course of brick, or set back in three feet of brick, but it still opens out of it. So and we'll see that when we get on the, on the door, and there's a couple more examples, but getting into locks, uh, the key and knob at the top, the mortise, the rim lock, uh, you got bed bolts, uh, and the panic card on the bottom. Uh, this is pretty common on almost every door you guys are gonna probably encounter that you'd ever need to force entry. The throw on these, three quarters of an inch, maybe a little more, maybe a little bit less, not terribly challenging, uh, to force, okay, we know that. Um, these are locks in addition to um, this lock, which is your deadbolt. So for the most part, you're gonna have the key and knob lock, which may not be locked at all, but you'll probably have a deadbolt in, in most uh, quasi-urban areas. And then in addition to any additional locks, uh, a vertical deadbolt where uh, this male locks into the female, and kind of the same here, all right? So these are surface-mounted locks. They're kind of aftermarket locks. So. If you, if you guys have ever seen Seinfeld, if you ever notice his door, he's got like four of these locks. What they do in New York, because you can pick these, is they'll lock like two of them and leave two unlocked. So if I pull all your locks and I start throwing them, I'm locking your door. I'm locking the one that's unlocked. Does that make sense? So if you okay, lock them I'm all correct. and I throw them all, I unlocked your house. But if I lock two, leave two unlocked, I don't know what I'm locking and what I'm unlocking. So, uh, and, and they're real, these, these are real, real common, real part of there. When we go to defeat this lock, this is going to come out of there without a ton of force. You can see it's only half inch, three quarter inch throw. But when these, when the male is married to the female, you're not separating those two. You guys, does that make sense? What you're doing here, principle wise, everything else you're trying to get the door in a jam right. to separate to clear the throw of the latch. Is there anything there to clear? They lock together. You can't separate that. What are you actually defeating that bottom one? Screws. There you go. The screws. The hardware. So, and you'll find over and over and over again, if you guys have seen it, they'll spend $100 on a lock and they'll use drywall screws or whatever screws are in their pouches after lunch, a, a roofing nail, to fasten these things to what they're trying to secure. So I'm not, you're not looking at the big, shiny, expensive lock. You're looking, how can I get around this thing? You know, where they take a big, giant lock and then they use like a, a dog leash to secure a fence or something. Well, I'm not gonna cut the lock. I'm gonna go after that dog leash, right? So. I mean, we're all inherently lazy to one degree or another. Nobody wants to work harder than they need to, right? I mean, we all got into this so we could break stuff, get dirty, and swear, and not have a real job. So <laughs> and what I'm getting at is that, and those, that is get out of and those are the tricks of the trade. That's, I mean, we're, we're, we want to work smarter, not harder, okay? Use your brains, not your muscles. So, and that's the assembly we typically see. And then in addition to any of those additional uh, surface-mounted locks, but the deadbolt's the one that, is a little more challenging because the, the male of the throw is a little bit further. These, you guys, have, I'm sure you have tons of them. We have tons of them as well. Older style door, uh, mortise lock, in wood uh, jams. Not terribly difficult to defeat because there's not a lot of beef around it, but certainly if this was a metal door, which you'll find like in that top assembly, 
Uh, that could be recessed in a metal door. That could be a little bit more challenging. Those dead bolts could be, you know, a half inch. They could be a, an inch long, depending on, you know, how much money uh, they wanted to spend on it. And this is just another example of it. So they, that's got a one inch dead bolt. Um, and it, a lot of times, force in this thing, you'll probably snap the dead bolt, get a little bit of room, and then get the tool and, and finish it off. The rest of it isn't terribly challenging. This three quarter inch latch, you know, that's gonna fail pretty quick, but the dead bolts we can get hung up on. So these are uh, commercial doors. Um, I stole a lot of these pictures, but this is our commissary. So this has a panic bar with a three quarter inch throw, but it's got a dead bolt as well. Um, just sizing these doors up. This one here has a panic bar, but it has a lock up into the header and down into the sill. So that one's gonna be a, a little bit tougher. Um, and it's outward swinging. So this one here is, is a little bit uh, more fortified uh, panic hardware. It's got a, a longer pin. It's like an inch, inch and a quarter pin. And uh, this one's kind of the same. This one's almost, it kind of opens up like that. So basically they're all <coughs> uh, extra security doors. When I walk up to this door, if this sticker's on the back side of the door, I know it's going to give me a hard time. If I don't have a saw, I'm going to call for one. And if you're going to the rear, you should have a saw. But I understand there's not, we don't have tons of saws to go around. If the saw's in front of the place, in front of the occupancy, maybe wait a second or have your partner wait a second. When you get around to the rear and start working on the door, the saw needs to make its way back there because that's where they're going to be. So, something we'll probably go to and talk about, something just how we operate. If Larry and I are in the back room together for the day, we're in the snorkel we'll operate. Our job is the rear. That's it. Our job is the rear. If we go to a rear commercial structure, we're bringing the saw. We're bringing maybe the rabbit tool. We're bringing our irons. What is that right there, plan A, B, and C? We might even bring our our uh, hydraulics, our spreaders. We have uh, cordless operating drops. I know you don't have that capability, but I'm just saying, what do you guys have here in Cicero or whoever else is listening out there in internet land? What do you guys have in your departments that you can bring? What's plan A, B, C, and is there a D? Because that's how you should come in. Because the worst thing to do, you got to go half a block to get around the rear of the building, go back to your spring your halogen, and now I see all this fortified stuff, chains and everything else, like, son of a bitch, now I got to call for that saw. You know? How can you marry you guys up with complement of tools that marry and, and work together with each other to get in that room? You need a plan. And the first guy gets back there should size it up. I mean, we had spreaders behind. We had several doors last night that we needed the spreaders to open up. There, there was no, other than torches and saws, there was no way we were getting into these, this, this building. So it, it, it's not a, even, I don't know how portable your unit is or if it's mounted to the rig, to the truck or the squad. But that's a consideration. Get the whole power unit back there. The spreaders are, are going to work, you know, for, um, you'd be surprised how well they work. So uh, getting into pad box, um, just understand that a lot of uh, more expensive pad box have this heel and toe construction. So if you take the bolt cutter to one side, a lot of times you have to cut both. It's not usually a problem. Um, and when you're using a saw, you can kind of see the picture here. All right, so it has these recesses here. They go down in the base of like ball bearings. So when you hit that with a saw, it's not usually a problem. But if you're using bolt cutters, you have to cut both sides for that to fail. And these, these are earring locks, and these are different types of locks now. We're seeing more or less on the back of uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, we've seen them uh, on storage units and stuff like that. And, and the way to defeat these is go closest to the fatter part of the body, cut it here, because this slides back into here. If you cut this here, this pin slides out. So it's not all that common, but certainly, you know, you could run into them. You may see these on scissor gates, you may see them on, they're kind of putting these guarded locks yeah. everywhere. And, they're, and we'll talk about different ways to defeat these things. That one's not going to be one you're going to be able to twist off or use a ductile lock breaker. Um, it, it just doesn't work like that. So a hockey puck lock, um, you know, we used to say cut, a, this is the American Series 2000, pretty common, uh, like the first generation. It used to, you know, we used to say, we'll cut across American and the lock fails, and we'll show you how in a second. But that, you can't say that anymore because there's, now there's, you know, several different styles of this. But what we can say is that when you cut these, cut them three quarters of the way from the keyway. So it just so happens on this American series lock, where it says series 2000, that's where you dip your saw into. Or if you've got torches, that's where you'd burn it, okay? Um, or you can use a pipe wrench with a cheater. But now you guys have seen them, right? They're recessed um, in opening, so now you can't get the pipe wrench on them anymore. So every time they come out with a new lock and bad guys figure out how to defeat it, 
they have to come out with a new generation of, uh, you know, how are we going to beat the bad guys again? VPS came out to us and they had a bunch of displays and they said, well, how would you guys get through these VPS systems? And we kind of tinkered around with some tools and we showed them, this is how we would defeat your stuff. They said, good. And what do you, what do you think they, they went back to the drawing board and they designed uh, another generation of VPS that made it even harder for us to get into these buildings. So every time we figure out how to beat something or bad guys, they come out with a, uh, a way to, to beat us. So this is just what it looks like. There's a, um, three quarters of the way up, there's a male pin that goes into a female at the top of that lock. Uh, run the saw blade across it, kind of looks like that. Again, three quarters of the keyway, and that locks the top off. Uh, it's at the weakest link. That's the the reoccurring or the most this the redundancy of this program is you don't have to work that hard. Size, take a second, size the door up, and then go after the weakest link. Uh, and try before you pry. I, I I can only speak for myself, but I was working on a door one time, and a guy reached over my shoulder. And he popped the handle, and, he, and, he, and the door went open. And it was a relieving boss. And you know, I not only embarrassed myself, I, I embarrassed my company because now this guy travels all over the division at different firehouses. And what do you think he said? Well, hey, you know that that truck over there? They're not so good because this guy's an idiot. So I uh, that said, or you get truck, this right? You look at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really it, right? The look like right. Right. Yeah. 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 So it, it happens, you know. Uh, Thousand. Just take a second, real quick, try to throw your pride. And uh, what we're going to size up is the swing of the door. That's important to how we're going to operate on them. The locking device is sizing up which one's going to be the easiest. Where do I want to start? And check for a heat condition. Um, you know, the, the, the door that you come up to, and you can see orange around the door frame, that's, that's the door that obviously uh, there's a fire condition on the back side of it. Certainly uh, a door you're going to want to control. And we're going to get into that uh, as well. We're going to check for resistance top set or bottom, and basically what we're doing is we're sounding the door to kind of figure out where these locks are. For an inward swinging door, you, you don't expect a lot of resistance at the top and bottom, because why people are inherently lazy, we lock our doors right here. Nobody wants to get on a milk carton to lock their, their doors or, or bend over and lock their doors, unless they're doing something stupid on the back side of that door, a drug house or something like that. Now we'll run into doors that are typically more fortified at the bottom because what do, what do they do here in town at the bottom of the door to keep you out? They add anything here? They put a two by four and kick it back to something. Okay, we, we run into that quite a bit. That's a door that's gonna be terribly challenging and you're gonna have to go to the hinge side. Um, you're not, you're not gonna snap a two by four uh, in half. So and if you crossfit, you guys that are in your yeah. one yesterday, when you crossfitters, you're not snapping it. <laughs> These guys are crossfitters. They look like that. So, oh, see, I got it too. Oh, yeah. Even right. so, <laughs> so that's why we sound the door. And it might look like, well, why are you doing it? Why is this guy hitting the top of the door? And it's just to, um, you know, just to see, is there any additional locks that we're going to have to, you know, uh, eventually open up? Okay, let's talk swing a door tactics wise. Engine companies, would you want to be set up on one side of a door lock? Not work. This is door we're forcing. It's swinging out away from us. As an instrument, I want to be on this side waiting for the force of the door, or do I want to be on this side waiting for the force of the door? And does it matter? As this door swings in, as it swings, swings open, we're working our door, we're a truck coming, we're working the door. As it opens up, as things start blowing out, conditions change fast. Do I want to be on this side, so I got to wait to actually direct a streamline there or push any fire back? Or do I want to be on this side, so as it starts opening up, they're forced and they can duck out of the way that way? I can start truck. correcting my stream through the opening. Uh, I'll bleed the pipe down back here. So what Richie's saying is when the door opens, where is it generally opening to? Push it back to a wall, right? Opening to a wall, so you want to be able to get that stream in there to shoot into the building versus into the wall. So being on this side, I'm going to wait for the door to open all the way first off. Two is probably hitting the wall. But if I'm on this side, as they open the door, I could probably hit it straight down the hallway. I could be off to an angle. If it blows or conditions change, there's a, a flashover sometimes. I'm out of harm's way. I'm not in the, right in the mouth of the chimney. Vice versa, the door that swings towards us. This door swings towards us. I'd want to be on this side of it as an engine. I mean, let the truck guys force door and be over this way. Does that make sense? So you have the room for the door. You're out of the chimney. You're not staring. I know what happens by us is everyone goes to the door, and you're trying to force the door, and the engine guys are right behind you on top of you. Like, can you get in? You barely have room to work. Get the hell back. Get out of the way. Until I get the door open, what are you going to do? Use the pipe? I mean, seriously, you have to have room to work anyways. And 
take a step back and you can see what's going on at that. <coughs> so before you start working on the door, if you're in the crowded hallway or in the front lawn, just swing your tool around like this. I need at least this much room to work. And then start working on the door. On the pipe, if you're at the hinge side, it's an inward swinging door. Mm -hmm. You can maybe put that fire out before you get that front room. If it's a couch on fire in the front room, from the front lawn, I could darken that couch down before I get in uh, and under it. If you're on the opposite side, like Rich said, all you're hitting is that, that wall that the door opens against. Okay, so it, it does matter. It, in a crowded hallway, in a multiple dwelling, it's, it's not always positionally, you can't always get in that position because they're tight. But if you can, if you're on the front lawn or on the front porch, that's, that's the spot to be. And the whole Halligan Park move later just showed you, that works good if anyone's got more seniority on you, you want to move up the promotional list or someone you don't like. You know, you had to do it, you had to do it for a porch once or you, you had to do it. So again, uh, we are, I did. I was a very young guy. Always size up the weakest link. We mentioned the hundred dollar lock with 10 cent screws. And at the end of the day, a proper size up, it just, it equals less work. And that's the key, more efficient work, quicker work. And we get in and um, do our job. So different types of tools we'll get into here, uh, traditional hydraulic power tools, especially tools. Um, again, we mentioned this tool evolved from New York. There was a, uh, a fire in a bank in Manhattan in, uh, the, in the 30s. And uh, when they got in, they put the fire out, the fire department said, well, how did these guys get into this bank? Uh, they robbed it and lit it on fire. And they said, well, they used this tool. It was about a 40 inch claw tool, which looked like a shepherd's hook. So they grabbed it and it was on the rig and then the, they started putting these tools on the rig. Well, the problem with it, it was curved so you couldn't drive the forks in. It was, it was a chisel more or less to create a mechanical advantage. So this guy named Chief Kelly came out, he put the ads on it, that 90 degree chisel part. So now you could strike the tool in, okay? It had a striking surface that wasn't rounded. Um, that became a Chicago patrol bar here. This guy decided to put the pick on because he liked the pick of the claw tool and you know the rest is history. Boston actually had him on the rigs before New York. But, um, so this is the guy that, that developed it. It came from there and um, we checked yesterday, the guy checked in the basement to see if he had any. If you have this one with the AMDG, it's worth some money. Take it out of service and you can get about two grand for one of those. Or bars. I'll give you two brand new Halloween bars if you give me your old broken down one that's in the basement. So someone already went scavenging yesterday, so you guys are on a look. They already looked to see if they're on the rigs or in a basement. They're in a shop. These are, I mean, not for nothing, but if you dug one of these up, you could get fifteen or two thousand dollars for one of these people. You know, the original original ones, the top four it actually has a signature on it. That's yeah. the one that are worth cheap, a good amount of money. I mean, people are paying a lot of crazy, crazy money. Uh, one of the original ones, or not all of it, or someone else. I don't know if that, we do have one of those. We have one too, but I know it's not one. That one already had. Yeah. 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 It was an easy uh, one. It would depend, but I can I can assure you those are. Easy to read. Especially on the East Coast. The East Coast loves that stuff. Because people, what they do is they buy these and they make like retirement cases for guys when they go out to job and you know they you know put the patches of the companies they were in and one of these things. So yeah, if you got one, I'll take it off your hands. I'll give you two fresh for brand new bar. But so just so we're all kind of speaking the same language, and that, that was the idea of this program was that the West Side Fire Department was speaking uh, the same language as the South Side Fire Department. And um, that way, if I was on a detail on the west side, I'm working over here, and you know, you said, hey, you know, stick the neck in or strike the ads, we were all on the same page. So, um, you get the ads we mentioned is that flat part, a striking surface. It's also a, a cold chisel if you needed it. The pick is for obvious reasons, the shaft. The neck is right here where it all kind of comes together, and that's going to come into play uh, when we get our hands on the tool. So, just again, just so we're, we've we're all vocabulary is all uh, on the same page. The bevel and the concave, this tool, a lot of thought was put into this tool. The original Halligan tool didn't have these bevels and concaves, it was just a straight fork. So this actually provides greater leverage or it can make it easier to get it into position on the back side of the dam. So it kind of depends on which side you use first. Um, and there's nothing that says you can't use both. Use one side, get the bar, as far as we go, flip the bar over and then use the leverage. And we'll get in that when we get in the hands on. So 
this is the bevel, the concave sort of C shape, the crotch for obvious reasons, and then the shoulder of the bar. Um, another striking surface if you, if you uh, um, take the round out of it. And here's the difference. This is that three-piece uh, hooligan uh, Paratech. Paratech tool. It's, it's, um, they have them here. It's pinned here at the forks. You guys don't have them? They have, they okay. have, they have a Paratech that's welded. They have a Paratech that's pinned. And they uh, have a, one probar. We, have, we found one probar in our okay. basement that they actually pulled out. And, then there's the, Good. That, uh, and you'll see why when you start working on these doors, you'll see why, why this is important. And it's the difference between, we mentioned uh, the tool's got to go between the door and the jam, and it's got to get driven in. Well, it's a lot easier to drive this credit card between the door and the jam than a door chop. Again, if the idea is let's not work so hard. We don't need to work so hard. So if you had the choice, and we'll get we'll, we'll show you downstairs, we're gonna go ahead and grab the skinny tool because it's gonna it's gonna be more efficient. It's gonna get into position a lot quicker. Um, the irons, uh, they just they marry together for for a reason. Uh, a typical Halligan tool, does anybody know how long it is? Okay. Well, how long's your axe handle? Anybody know? It's 32 inches. Okay, just as a sidebar, why would 32 inches? Why does that go? Hey, that's that's a good number to know. It's a measuring stick for what? For your rafters when you're on your roof. Okay, you can lay out a roof with, the, with your axe handle. If you can find one that's been on 16s, you can lay out that whole roof, and that's a whole other thing. But so the tool, the Halligan, is typically uh, they're 30 inches because of uh, building codes. Most doors are supposed to be at least 32 inches, and a lot of other occupancies, they gotta be wider than that, handicapped four feet wide, right? So when we're talking about working on doors, a 30 inch Elgin tool can work on a door without stepping out of bounds. And we'll get into that when we're downstairs when we're talking about doing the hands down. But I can work on this door and not have to go, if this door is recessed in a cubby hall, I can work on this door and I'm not prying into the brick wall. So, and we'll, you'll get it when we get downstairs. So, and this is just a knockdown ball, Fort Bludgey tool, peak roof uh, tool. Uh, and it's got the thing on the top and there you got it. So, as far as uh, bladed tool maintenance, it's not a it's a bad idea actually to take your tools to a grinder. They look parade ready. You can shave with them, but you take the temper out of the metal, and they look good is until you hit a nail and you'll have a giant gouge. So you got to do it the old-fashioned way with a little elbow grease and a bastard file. It doesn't take very long. It doesn't take as long as you think um, to put a nice edge on this thing. You don't want this to be terribly sharp, it's not like razor sharp, but I need it to be sharp because sometimes on warehouse doors or whatever, I want it, I, I can use it as a chisel if it's sharp. This pick I want sharp, I want it I want it nail sharp because as I'm driving that into a sill or into oak floor, I want it to pierce the oak floor. If it's blunt, if it's dull from doing search drills and stuff, it's not gonna do what it's supposed to do for me. So, you know, this, this I try to keep a nice, you know, re reasonably good edge on this, but this one here I want, I want I want that to be kind of sharp. You want a good edge, edge on your fork and ads, because sometimes you may have tight doors too, you want a nice edge, but it's all boogered up with gouges and nicks yeah. that will kind of defeat your purpose. It, it'll slow you down for sure, something else. So I draw tools, we already mentioned spreaders, guys. It's a, it's a thought, it's an idea. We have the battery operated ones, they come off the rigs. Ironically, we did a drill on it yesterday and then last, this morning or last night, um, it came off the rig, went to the rear and got about four or five doors open. Um, this is our, our rabbit tool, which, which you guys have, okay? Rabbit tool. How many inches of spread do you get from a rabbit tool? Average. Four to four to six. Four to six. Four to six. 10,000 pounds of force, okay? That's good to know. What you need to know, will this pump work in any position? No. How many of you guys know? Will this push fluid down like this? Yeah. Not break? Okay. Will it work flat? Yeah. Will it work up? No. It will not work in this position. Something to know about your rabbit tool. Okay, the other downfall of a rabbit tool compared to a hydrogen ram. A hydrogen ram is basically this component attached right to the pump here. That can work in any position, and it's a one-man operation. This here, you sometimes do need two people. We'll show you a picture later how one person can make it work with a piece of webbing. But using these scenarios, you sometimes know, need two people to operate it. Because you need to get this in place and get a bite on it, get pressure, then maybe you can let it go. But if you have to reposition it and it falls out, it's kind of a pain. But the key thing is for you guys, in, our, in the job by us, they're stored in a bag about this size, which well, doesn't fit in there very well, connected. So you disconnect the hose, because it's a quick disconnect in ours. They open up the bleed valve, and they store it in a bag. 
They go to use it. What happens? They put the hose on. They think it's on. It's not. This son of a bitch won't see the piece of crap. It's broke. So I'm going, oh, wait, wait, check the hose. All right, they get the hose to work. Then what? They go to pump it. Nothing. They forgot the bleed valve's open. They finally close the bleed valve, go to pump again. But then the guy's holding up pumping. This thing's still ain't working. It's broke. There's nothing wrong with the tool. It's a lack of understanding of its operation. Yeah, if the bleed valve's engaged, the, the, hose, the hose won't go on. If this should operate with like one pump, it should be good to go. If it's not, okay, that, that's in good shape. If it's not, pump it all the way up. So, um, check on the pressure. And then put this lower than this. Try to stand this up, and it'll reset the hydraulics, and it'll be ready to go. Basically, what you're doing is you're bleeding all the bubbles back into the chamber where they're supposed to be. But this this one's in pretty good shape. So. The other thing you got to know about that too is you're supposed to put it on the load like once a week. You're supposed to load the load on the tool once a week. So if you're here and you so got grab that it, door, throw it on the, the throw it at the guy on the couch, the load yeah, on the couch. Yeah, yeah. 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 The mouse, mouse. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now we got something for one <laughs> week. I'm sorry. <laughs> so again, like you guys said, 10,000 pounds of horse. And you know, you're only limited by imagination with the tool. So the burglar bars works great. You know, get that back behind burglar bars, top burglar bars off. So you know, think outside the box. Um, tools, here's your K12, not the K12. Whatever you want to call it. The blade on top, I can give you it's just a picture of the concrete cutting blade. But um, most of our metal cutting blades are going to look uh, like that, top of this, or you may have uh, this diamond tip plate, which is out, out, of, out of this world, but um, if you don't, no worries. Um, does anybody, is anybody familiar with this one? Yeah, we have one of these. Okay, just so you know, we had a guy almost get hurt pretty bad. Um, we started to develop, in the first generation of this blade, it didn't have enough of the heat kind of dispersal system or whatever, heat releasing pins and stuff. So we started to develop these little fissures or cracks in it, and this guy had it revved up, and he, and he put it in it. He, he like probably, if I know him, he probably rammed it into the hinges. Well, it seized on the hinges. The blade shattered. <coughs> it tore the shroud and the arm off of the body of our flying. An immense amount of force. And like I said, that metal blade shattered, and somehow he walked away from that. So if a piece of metal hits you in the neck, you're you're, you're going to. So that said, if you have one of those, just in a, uh, we looked at it every morning. I never, I never noticed these little, they're like Fisher little cracks. hairline cracks. Yeah. So we sent it out to everybody, the companies we knew had it. Like, hey, pay attention to this because if you're, if you're some of that might have been our fault. A little poor maintenance on our part. Yeah. Really take a look at your blades and check it. I guarantee that wasn't the first day that crack was there. No, I wasn't. Some look like scratches. Some are actually gouges. It's hard to tell. Clean that blade real good and get a look. We did. I can't say that was the only reason why it failed. I, we don't know if it was full RPM and it yeah. was buried into the metal. Because what's the problem when I go up to the saw, full RPM and buried in the metal? What usually happens? You could find if it bites, and that might happen. Or what else? Walks around, right? You probably got to feather the trigger, get a little groove. You got to cut a door all the way down. You're cutting a, a third door or a doggy door. You might want to feather that trigger to start a groove going. Once you get a groove, then you can bring your saw in. It's not like a flat rope or a uh, peak rope where you got the K950 with a wooden blade. You just boom, bury it in, right, and it goes to work. Can't do that with metal. That may have been an option as well. I don't know, but it literally shattered the arm off. It was hanging down, and chunks flew through the uh, the shroud or the guard. Lucky ain't that, I mean, in all reality. Yeah. Heat diamond grip blades, the one of the combination it was, concrete and steel ones? Yes. Yeah, oh, it was so. the first generation of it. So it didn't have, this one's a little bit better. The fins. The fins are about the same size, but it has all these, these holes that you guys probably can't see, but really cool. it has all these relief six in a, in a series of six all the way around. So that releases the heat, you know, because of what happens to metal when it's heated, right? It, it stretches. Well, the problem was it was creating these cracks in this thing, and it, it was hard to see. I mean, if you held it up to the light, there was no light shining to it or anything. No, we just missed it. It was an accident, and well, again, well, the other he's, 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 uh, he's a, a lot, to be honest with you. <coughs> that same guy's in this PowerPoint down there. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Somewhere else as well. And then you'll understand why it was probably uh -huh. uh, yeah. not, not the saw that the operator. But near composite this, there's how many different types are there? You got concrete and metal, basically, right? So if you do have both on the rig, maybe spray paint them so you know at 3 in the morning which is which. Uh, I, I'm sure you have the disc on your 
the metal pipe this time is ready to go for work for uh, uh, fire duty. But uh, again, the, the thing with these, those could fail us too if we do what? And properly what with them? Storm. Storm with what? Storm. Gasoline, right? And oil, it permeates the disc. And, and it, you know, they look good to go. They look ready to go. And then you introduce them to something and they'll shatter. And the same thing can happen. Also, in the last few minutes, I want to speed it up. But remember your RPMs. Different blades have different RPMs. No one ever saw it as operated. Whether it's a Husker barn, a can, a partner, a still, whatever. Like that one's about 5400 RPM on that software location. Sometimes different blade manufacturers have different RPMs. If you put a blade that's made to operate a smaller RPM, say 4800 compared to 5400, you can have some problems. You get some warping. You can get some uh, blade breakup or damage. So something to think about with your blades. You can hurt pretty quick. The, the other thing too, uh, we noticed this yesterday when we, we did some things with the soft uh, uh, tiller truck. Uh, there's a there's a set screw on there to set the tension on your uh, bellow. So that was a little loose, so we, we talked about that. And uh, the 5400 RPM thing is, is very, um, you need to know that because it can hurt you real bad. Uh, you get that torque and you, you, you blow into a metal door or a metal garage door or something and you're not paying attention, you get that bounce back. You got 5400 RPM that you're trying to deal with. So be cognizant of what's going on. Know, the, know when you check your cell, what are you checking? Are you checking the blade? Are you checking the uh, belt? Are you checking the tension of the belt? When you started, are you putting your uh, foot in the trigger handle where the fuel's at? So are you creating cracks in the fuel tank? So it's just, it's different things to talk about and we can go through some of that time too. Just firing it up in the morning and letting it run and it, you know how it dances around? That's, that's abrading your, the bottom of your fuel tank. Tools right at the bottom of that tool, so you can start to develop holes in that stuff. If you, well, if you so. look, I mean, these are made for the construction, so if you look, it's kind of on that angle, and all that bouncing over time is going to create stress fractures in your, in your fuel tank. Your fuel tank is actually where your trigger is at, your that handle at portion. Uh, a couple, just a couple specialty tools, real quick. Um, Duckbill lock breaker, it's just a piece of like three quarters flat stock. It goes from zero to, I don't know, maybe four or five inches, which I had, it was not working out for me last night. You tried it? Yeah. yeah. I bought it myself, and I'm like, there was, the rip company was right there, and nobody was like, hey, you want to just want to help her? No, this up. So <laughs> this is a, it's a great tool for maybe lesser, uh, for maybe two people, or um, locks that aren't all that good. This, this these tapes have pretty good locks. So, it's just an option, and what that does is it will get into it a bit. But uh, I'll, these are all lock pulling devices. This one spins the lock out, and if you notice, uh, the handle is just a pair of pliers. But they uh, ground this one down to like a straight edge, like a like a flat edge screwdriver. And this one is 90 to like a flat edge screwdriver. And we'll talk about why that's important in a bit. Uh, again, a, another A frame lock pulling device. You slide your ads into there and pull K tool. These slide down over locks. Uh, these pick the locks. Rich talked about the hydroram, the buddy tool, it's a one person uh, hydraulic force electric tool, and then torches. So, um, you know, acetylene or pentagen, and uh, that's an arc air. Uh, what we talk about, you guys don't have torches, right? No torches. You don't have a lock breaker, so you pretty much get your saws, your irons, your regular force one three tools, right? Your rabbit tools, and if possible, hurts equipment, right? Or whatever, else, what kind of hydraulic equipment you operate. Mm -hmm. What is it? Genesis, Genesis, Hearst, the Hearst, Hearst, yeah, and Hearst, 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 Hearst. Yeah, Okay, so you have that. Okay, so there are your options. There's plan A, B, C, D. That's what you have. But do any of the neighboring towns have any of that other stuff we just talked about? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so something to know. If you go into a commercial structure and you have a lot of problems on a rear of a structure, a lot of things to force, homemade gates, and you'll see some things come up in the PowerPoint, you might want to call it. And I know that whole, we don't call no one in because I know you look at us. So. Just think about it. if you need it, know what's there, know who has it. If you need that torch, if you need maybe some other specialized equipment that a neighboring town does have. And that, that, that middle size K tool is about 100 bucks. So I don't know how many companies you have, but it's only 100 bucks and you get everything you need. You get the tools and the pouch. And remember, I like to break shit just like the next guy, but we're also here to preserve people's That tool there makes you a professional fire. How many here are professional firefighters? Doesn't mean because you have a local number, right? It means the work we do at a building, how we present ourselves, or how, how their opinion of us, because they can affect our contracts, we have opinion. That K2, I can pull a cylinder, unlock the door, go in, do my business, 
lock it when I leave, and they spend a couple bucks to get a new locking cylinder, that's it. As compared, when I go up, I break the glass, or I cut the latch, a couple other things, a lot more. You're talking hundreds of dollars of damage compared to only a couple dollars, okay? And then I can relock it, so it works well. Works well when you got those investigations, other doors. But even like the lock breaker of the case, well, I'll be honest with you, it's not our rig. It sits in the compartment in the box right Do you think I throw it in my pocket and bring it with me? It's not in my thought process usually. Now there was some article in fire engineering like, oh, carry a case in your pocket. I'm not gonna do that, I'm sorry. I probably won't carry the case in my pocket. I got enough crap that I don't even want in there in the first place. But when you go to these buildings, if you can recognize them, great. If you can recognize them on your ammo runs, your inspections, when you're out and about, whatever. Hey, that'd be a good building for that, great. If you can remember, great. But when you get back there, we said that first guy's doing that size up, if you recognize those things, then call for it early is really the point. Call for it early so it can come back there if you have some of the specialized equipment. And don't duplicate your tools. The, the only reason I went for that duct fill thing was because the spreaders were in the back of the building and, and our metal cutting saw was in the front. So I wasn't going to not do anything. I'm like, I'll get that. And, and I grabbed the, the K tool too. We ended up not using it because it was a fire. We actually just broke the glass, all the, you know, all the glass. So just different options. This is how the K tool works. This is the back side of it. This is what it looks like. What it does is it's, it's kind of not razor sharp, but sharp, uh, and it just slides down over locks. And then you just you, as simple as just a little bit of leverage. Uh, it doesn't work on every lock, but you can pull the lock out. Um, if you look at the back of the lock, this is kind of pear shaped. This one is kind of straight. That tells you which end of this tool to use. This comes down to like a, a point, like a, a flathead screwdriver. Well, if I pull this lock. And I got that pear-shaped thing. I'm going to reach in with this 90 degree angle and just throw the lock. It's 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 really that easy. Um, or if I pull this rim cylinder, which would be on those surface-mounted locks, uh, vertical deadbolt. This is what they'll have. Then you just reach in. And it's as simple as turn turn the key, and it's and it's open. So and again, it's a professional thing to do because now we can relock the place. Kind of spin the thing back in. It'll look like when the bad guy's walking by that later that night when you guys take off. It'll look like it's locked, and it will be locked. Uh, and then the guy will just have to replace that cylinder, um, you know, the next day. So gates, uh, not uncommon. We get, you know, they're everywhere. So uh, we got a chain here. I get around to the back. I can, I can do two things. I can call for a saw. Uh, uh, I can do a couple things. I can jump over the gate. But at the end of the day, this is what we're going to do. These gates have a male and a female, typically. Um, the males at the top on the top hinge, and the male is on the bottom of the bottom hinge. If you strike these hinges down to separate the male from the female on the bottom, or hit the top up, all right, pull the male from the female, what happens is now the hinge side becomes um, becomes sort of the latching side. I'm sorry, I thought there was another picture there. Anyway, what'll happen is, if, if this side of the gate is still locked, this side will open now. So just separate the male from the female, and it comes right apart. And all you need is a striking tool for that. You don't need a saw. Uh, different challenges, we have scissor gates, ornamental iron, uh, we'll talk about these as we get them, what they look like, drop bars, door club, BPS. Uh, scissor gates, this is a commercial scissor gate because uh, it has the tracks at the top and the bottom. Uh, most of our scissor gates don't, they, they just, they're hinged on one side and you just slide them over and there's a lock and they kind of, uh, they're sort of uh, loose at the top and bottom. Um, we have them on the back of storefronts front of storefronts, we have a lot of apartment buildings that you get in an apartment building and then they're on the actual apartment uh, door before you get into apartments. This one's a little bit more involved. Um, the problem with this one uh, is you can't lift the bottom of that up. So if somebody, uh, it's never happened to me, but I have friends that have had somebody die on the other side of scissor gates because they didn't have the right tool and they weren't able to get them out. But if you ever have that, if you reach to the bottom of the scissor gate and you pull it up, that's a lot of times that's enough for a regular sized person to get out of. So it's not, you don't have to sit and watch somebody um, die. So that's just an option. If you don't, if you have a pickhead axe and you've got scissor gates, chances are pretty good you're not, you're, you're not going to be able to get those open. The howling tool, you have, you have a chance. All right. Um, here's what we would do with the howling tool. Again, try to separate the shackle from the lock body by just sheer force, driving the pick through the through the lock. Hopefully we can uh, pull those apart and slide the scissor gate open. Or if you put the force on and just start spinning it, a lot of time if, if it's a cheaper lock, that'll bend and twist the shackle and then separate the shackle from the lock body, okay? This is just something that, that we like to throw out. 
We have scissor gates on the back of targets all the time, but if you put scissor gates on the front door as well, if the lock is on the inside of the scissor gates, chances are pretty good somebody's in that apartment. If you can't reach the lock from where you're standing outside that front apartment door, somebody lock that and they're probably inside. So that, that's gonna change the way I search because now I'm not kind of doing the duck crawl thing. I'm gonna be on my hands and knees because people don't levitate, you know? I mean, they're gonna be, they're gonna be on the ground that's where you're gonna find it, so. And it, this is a couple other uh, examples of what we're talking about. All right, uh, we talked about, I know Rich mentioned uh, um, the locks and when you go to hit these things because they move, uh, you know, again, start just kind of feather the trigger, get a little bit of a groove going, and then once you once you get that groove, then you can open the saw and lean on the lock, cut both sides, it'll fall away, and uh, and open the open the door. This is how that lock breaker works. Again, it's wedge shaped, and the idea is as I drive that wedge down through the lock, uh, it separates the lock from the lock body. You could probably have one, if you bought one out of a fire magazine, it'd probably be a hundred dollars. You could probably have one of those made for 10 bucks. Uh, you know, if you just went to a machine shop and told them what you, what you were thinking about. And again, the nice option is this isn't the first thing to come off the rig, but that's all that was left on the rig for me. That's what I grabbed. Uh, it didn't work out for me so good, but um, I think if I had somebody driving me in, it would have worked out a little bit better. Um, so when it comes to, uh, Attacking scissor gates. Usually scissor gates are hinged. So if we have scissor gates on this door, a lot of times uh, the gate slides open this way so the lock could be over here. So you have two choices. If we're gonna, if you can't beat the lock, what we're gonna do is try to pry the scissor gates out of the jam. All right? Sometimes they're put in again with drywall screws. They've got the suspensive assembly, but they just put them on with roofing nails or duct tape. Or they could be lagged in, which is going to be a little, a little bit more challenging for us. If you're going to do that, if you're going to leave the lock and throw the scissor gates to one side or the other, consider your next step. If I force the scissor gates over to here, and now I got to work on this next door right here, I just kind of, kind of, you know, put a real road bump in my way. Somebody's going to have to hold those gates open like this if they even have the room. So if I'm going to force an assembly out of the jam, I want to force that assembly over to the hinge side of the next door. So now. I got a clean straight shot at this one. Don't put that stuff in your way. Because when I got, when I started with Chicago, they said you always force it this way. And that to me, it's just, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, it, I mean, there's, always, there's not a lot of always and never in the You gotta be, kind of try to remain flexible. But that to me seemed like a real bad idea. So I would, we would recommend that you just get it out of your way for, for your next door. Um, these are ornamental iron gates. These are pretty popular in, in, in uh, uh, middle class and, and urban neighborhoods in the city. And these are just outward swinging doors. A lot of times this deadbolt is keyed on the inside. Uh, and a lot of times people just leave the key in there. Um, you know, if, if not, it might be have a thumb throw. So really all you gotta do is kind of poke your hand through the screen and just kind of feel if it's not there, if the key's not there and it's not thumb, then you're just gonna force this in a traditional outward opening way, and we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. They're not terribly challenging. So this is more or less what we had last night. So it's very comparable to this. And it, you know, again, right out of the gate, this is gonna be challenging with traditional setup force blanchard tools because uh, there's not a lot of give in this. <laughs> there's very little give. This has horizontal reinforcement, uh, flat stock going back to the, to the uh, hinges. So this door's not really gonna crush. And the brick's probably not going to give, and it looks pretty tight. So automatically, right out of the gate, we need we need saws. We need we need the hearse tool back here. If you had more than one of these doors, I would, depending on where your rig's at, it might it might actually save you time to go get the power unit, bring that back, set that up, and, and operate on these doors. Because you're going to be here a while if you're trying to do this with just hand tools. You know, we all get caught up and think, I got to go 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 go, and the rig's too far away. We can do it with this, but. I'm just suggesting that, you know, if you take the time, send two guys back around or call for the next truck coming in and say, hey, listen, go, grab our hearse tool, grab your hearse tool, bring it to the back of this building because that's going to be a real problem if we don't um, have saws ready, readily available or, you know, if the saws are in front or if you have, you know, four or five of these in a row, I, I uh, suggest the hearse tool. So, um, drop bars. They can be found in inward and opening, inward and outward opening doors and there's a, there's a, uh, We'll talk about the fold heads in a minute. 
These, uh, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is an outward swinging door, so it's not flat to the wall. It's recessed in a course of brick, or at least uh, half a course of brick. But it is an outward opening door because we've got the hinges. Okay. Um, this is the inside of a commercial space that has a metal drop bar. All right. This is the inside of, uh, of a residential garage that has a drop bar or a, a, a two by four. And this is an outward swinging, recessed, outward swinging uh, commercial door. But what you notice about these is on the outward swinging door, because of the way these uh, drop arms work, you may be able to see those bed bolt heads, those, those lag bolt heads. If you see that, that's automatically, I need a saw. I, I, I need a saw. Can you force these with your hand tools? You'll be there, you'll be there a while. I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging. Uh, and we'll get into how in a bit, but I, I definitely would prefer to have uh, a saw with me when I'm working on this door too got bolt heads here, something in the middle there that might be a, uh, you know, kind of a peephole or, you know, we don't know, but it's out of the ordinary. So anything out of the ordinary, you know, you might want to have a saw with you. <coughs> these doors, so we're on the inside, these are inward swinging doors. Um, you won't be able to tell, you probably won't be able to tell that these drop bars are on here. This latch is welded to the frame, so you can't see that from outside. These are tapped on into the wall, they're not lagged all the way through, so when I go to sound this door, when I go to <coughs> I hit that door and I hit it down low and there's not a lot of give or deflection in the bottom of that door, some uh, kind of a flag should go up and go, all right, this one's going to give me a hard time. There's something different going on on the backside of this door. Truthfully, you know, most of the time, and then the, the deadbolt here, that's, there's a little extra security there so the deadbolt doesn't blast out the back of the frame. Usually these aren't terribly challenging to force. But if I'm, I hit this thing two or three times and there's no give at all, I didn't get any gap, then something's wrong, something's different and it's gonna give me a hard time. So how do we do it with hand tools? Well, this is one where you can drive your pick uh, through, try to drive that all the way through and then knock the, the, the heads of those through um, or try to shear them off. You can take uh, the saw and cut at a 45 degree angle, all right, and cut the deadbolt head away from the rest of the threaded rod and what will happen is hopefully uh, the inside, the keeper will drop away. But what I suggest is, as opposed to this picture, do the latching side, because where that drop bar is, over here on the latching side, if I can get this, this uh, cradle to drop and fall, well, then it's just an ordinary door. This hinge side doesn't matter as much as the latching side. I'm not that concerned about the hinge side. If I can get the latching side, the bar to drop away, then I can open this door uh, in traditional, with traditional force entry. Um, techniques. So this is something I think you could probably get at a Home Depot or, uh, or you know, Menards. It's basically just a door kicker. All right. It, when you when you go to hit that, when you go to force this thing, there's not going to be a lot of uh, give in this thing. Um, in the old days, this would be called a police lock. In New York, these locks would slide up into a, a, a lock, and then they were recessed into the ground. I never saw one, but um, allegedly they're out there, and and they're pretty tough. Pretty tough to force. It'll take two guys, but we can maybe bend that rod in half. Or if it's kind of, if we can get a little compression or uh, bend in this thing, when we release the door, maybe it'll kick out. Um, because those locks are really old in old parts of you know uh, town, this recessed hole would build up with dirt, so really wasn't in that hole very as well as it was 70 years ago. So with with kind of forcing this door back and forth. Sometimes you can get the bottom of that to kick out, and then it's just a normal door. But this one here, this two by four, is kicked back to a <coughs> plate, you know, another two by four inside of this wall, and uh, that one is going to be tough. When you hit the bottom of that door and there's no give, um, you know, you might have to consider going to the hinge side. But just like the plate glass door, if we go to the hinge side, what do we do? We can't close the door, right? We lost control of ventilation. So once you blast the hinges off, which you can do, now we can't put the, a door between you and the fire if you have to. So three-way lock, again, consider the occupancy. If it's a, you know, a penny candy store, it's probably not gonna be terribly challenging to get into, but if it's a currency exchange and you're in the rear, you're probably gonna need the Hearst tool. So it's just, it's just basic size up stuff. Again, anything out of the ordinary. We have offset bolts here and a keyway in the middle. Okay, box lock, um, not all that common here, but this one is, okay, this is kind of like a box lock. You take this lever and you slam it over, it's got that, uh, that flat stock goes 
the male flatback goes into that jam, you know, an inch or two or three inches. You know, <coughs> this one's kind of the same way. It's just kind of this old fashioned type of bisque. You slam the bar over and that male goes into that female. So we can still get this. We just got to defeat these screws. We're probably not going to bend that flat stock in half, but hopefully we can blast these screws off the jam. This one's going to be a little more, um, a little more trouble. This is our VPS door, and this is um, still prevalent, but uh, again, every generation after we learn how to defeat these, they come out with uh, more improved ones. But just remember, if you get something like this, and you guys said you have them in town, cut the triangle close to the um, to your hinges. And then it's just a matter of slide your hand in here and slam that lock down, slam that lever down. If you cut this side, okay, you cut the latch inside, you cut through the lever assembly, the door will not open now. Now you have to cut it all the way open. You have to make a door to door. So it's real important. You got a 50-50 shot at this. If you get it wrong, it's gonna screw you up. Always cut that triangle, and it just needs to be big enough for somebody to get their hand in. Cut that triangle towards the hinge side. If you see that, this side will. Okay, so this would be the door that the contractor would go in and out of, whether it's the back door, the side door, or the front door. Okay, because they can go in, they can lock themselves in the building, they can work all day, and then they can leave the building and lock it up. These are the doors that would be on, on the, the back, or the, the doors that they don't use. Okay, there's nothing on here to get in and out of this building. You can only open this door from the inside. And it's a simple um, slide bolt that goes in here and they can lock it from the inside if they want to. Uh, a lot of times they don't, they just slide the, the, the flat stock in. And then if you, where you see VPS, and the bolts, that's, that's where those locks are. So it's just a matter of cutting like to the other side of the bolt, you cut this in half, and the door just opens up. That's an outward swinging door. How do we know? Because we got hinges. And here's another one. This is the computer pad one. This one is locked all the way down the side of the frame. So what, what our fire academy recommends is start at the header, cut all the way through the header as best you can, and bring this all the way down and just make it door to door. So this would stay put because there's so many locks on that, it's pretty tough to defeat. Um, they're out there. So, and this is the, this is the whole nuts and bolts of this. Technique plus leverage equals success, right? Work smarter, not harder. It's labor intensive. It should start right away. If I get up to the apartment door first, I'm gonna start working on the door, and if I pop it, great, I'll, maybe I'll pull it shut, depending on the conditions, and wait for the engine. But I'm not gonna wait for the engine to get there and go, okay, you got water to start working on a door to find out that there's a bunch of two by fours on the back of this door and we're gonna be there a while. So, you know, start your job, control the door, control ventilation, and then uh, make your move when you're, when you're ready. Uh, again, the, your size up should include potential delay in getting water. So, you know, don't stick your neck out if it's gonna be a while to lay a hand on this place. Control the door, we'll, we're gonna go over all the hands-on stuff downstairs if that's okay, we're not gonna fill you with all these Unless pictures. Unless you wanna store every one of these PowerPoints with you. But just, uh, again, the way the forks work is this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you can start with the bevel towards the door, okay? But the problem is the bevel, the way the bevel works, the, the tips are pointing into the jam or at the bevel towards the jam and the tips are kind of pointing where you want them to go. And we're gonna go over that downstairs. The difference is if I have the bevel towards the jam, which is technically probably the easier way to do this, we don't have as much spread. If you put the, the concave towards the jam, the bevel towards the door, you get an additional half inch or three quarters of an inch in leverage. And that's why the tool is designed that way. There's no right or wrong way to do this. You know, some manuals might say, you gotta do this, you gotta do it this way all the time because that provides the greatest leverage, and it does. But we can probably maybe start with this, get it as far as it'll go, then pull the tool off, flip it around, and then, and then finish it. It's one additional step but it's a lot faster to do it the, the easy way. Um, but a lot of people aren't good enough to, to be aware of how the curve works. They end up burying the forks into the jam, in a mortar, and then the tool gets stuck, and you're not really getting anywhere, and you're kind of jacking yourself up. So as Larry's pointing out, maybe two steps with the one on the left, but it's the easier way to get in the door. We'll show you that downstairs. And the door is gonna tell you. If it's a real loose door, if it's a real loose door and I'm looking at it, I'm like, ah, this is not gonna be a problem. I'll, I'll do this, but if it's really tight, if it's a metal door and a metal frame backed up to concrete, I'm probably gonna start this way because I know I'll get it in a position. It might not finish the door, but all I'll do is I'll keep that progress, pull the tool up, flip it around, and then, and then finish it. And we'll talk about it downstairs. And uh, you know, most of this we'll do downstairs. We'll talk about sounding the door. Uh, here's the other Sullyism. 
Um, if you're going to sound the door, again, energy doesn't disappear, it's transferred, right? So if I put my back into this, hitting this door and it doesn't open, okay, all that energy has got to go somewhere. Well, if my hands are on the tool like this, my hands will just slide down the tool. If your hand is at the ass end of that tool and I hit that door as hard as I can, all of that, everything I put into that, hitting that door just went into the palm of my hand. And you break it. And you break it. So. So, and then they've got to broke the saw, so. Yes. So again, guys, if, with your permission, we'll just kind of burn through this uh, real quick though. Baseball bat swing's not a great idea. Increase your striking surface. You can swing and miss. As soon as it starts to fatigue, oh, I'll swing and miss. There. The next slide will show you better. Just you crossing the tools. By crossing the tools? Increase so surface area? This is, you know, an inch to an inch and a half. Easy to swing and miss, and you're gonna hit your partner, break his forearm, break his hand, break his thumb. This way, it diminishes visibility where you start to get tired. Just cross the tools. This is probably the safest, not the most efficient, but you know, now for me to swing and miss, I almost gotta be trying, okay? Because I've increased the striking surface that, that much. The tool weighs eight pounds no matter how you hold it. It's as efficient in, in any position, really. So just, we're, all we're saying is just be a little, a little safer. And then be aware of where your hands are. If you, it, when you get tired or in diminished visibility, if you, if you choke up too high in that and you swing, I mean, uh, you may be like punching a brick wall with, with a weight in your hand. So Not only just the tool, we had it in class where we had a class there, but they were actually breaching walls. It was part of the drill. He breached the wall. The head, he had his hand choked up on the tool. What do you think happened when the head of the tool went through the cinder block? Head went through, and that's what the next thing hit. He was choked up like that picture. He smashed his fingers and broke a couple fingers. You don't okay. need your hand right next to the no. tool. Not to the head. You'll actually... You'll get, if the lower you are in the tool, you'll get more snap in the tool, the less you're choked up. If I'm choked up, I'm basically just hitting it like a hammer. If I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm down, Those ones are, yeah. damn it. Is that a tor tornado? Yeah, take cover. Uh, that's their lolly. Like, we're done with class. Yeah, get us out. Time. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Uh, class yeah. is done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. And see. So, Our favorite game. if you're having a hard time uh, forcing the tips through, if you can't the tool one way or another, just put it at an angle. You can start with just the tip and get just the tip in and then work yes, your way, work your way. Uh, yeah, a little tip or, 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 or forcible just entry, just the tip. Yeah. Yes. I know what you're thinking. It's consensual. Right. But start with the tip. And uh, right. to the door we'll get into, uh, we'll, if, if you guys don't mind, we'll just, we'll get into all this when we get yeah. to the door. And we're talking about outward swinging doors now. Pipe um, doors. Go back to that one, though. This one? Yeah. yeah. Real quick, what Larry's showing here with just the tip on the angle with the forks. This is just another variation of you have a really tight door jam. Maybe we start with the axe blade first to get a purchase point. And whenever we get a purchase point, whenever we make some progress, we want to capture it. Maybe I leave that axe in here until I get my halogen in. Now I take max out and I keep going. Just as we'll show you down there when you're forcing over the halogen bar, if you get some progress, stick a chalk in there. Capture your progress. Why lose it? I remember right, we four up in a high rise and we might have been together. We're forced a bunch of doors. I forced the door, the door swing open. Hit that back wall and swing back shut and relock on it. Awesome. I had to reforce the door. I just opened. What an idiot I was. So remember about that. We'll control the door. But here's a way you may have to start to get in doors that are really hard. And and they could be. And, and then you know we'll get into it. Uh, probably better just to do it downstairs. But you, there's different ways to get gaps on these things. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, though, um, I just I'll point this out. It, the tool. Um, in our uh, over aggressiveness, we can be aggressive to a fault with this. We need to be disciplined in this position and wait till the tool is set. When we're, when we're forcing this door, this tool is buried all the way down to the neck. This is the door that opens towards us. It's buried all the way down to the neck. Now I've got this tool. It's set. I've got this door. It's just a matter of time. You do a pull up off that bar. When it's set properly it's set. to either the crotch on the fork or the neck on the ads, you can hang off the thing and come out. When that bar pops off, because we don't have a good purchase point. We aren't wrapped all the way around the back edge of the door and around the jam. You'll see that. And what happens is, you know, you're on the front lawn or you're in that hallway and everybody's waiting. Come on, Larry, you. get us in. Come let's on. go, let's go, Come let's on. go. Give me that tool. I'll do it, I'll do it. You're like, no, I got it. And if the tool's not set and you go to pry and it pops out and everyone kind of thinks you're a jerk, but now you just kind of confirmed it. You know, so you have to say, listen, <laughs> relax, it's not your house. Please. Let me get this tool in position to force it. And, and then, we'll, you know, we're all gentlemen firemen here. And then we'll go about our business. But haste kind of makes waste in this. You need to be, and it does. It takes a fair amount of discipline to not kind of tune them out, you know. But 
it's got to be set or, or the tool is going to pop out when we go to do this, okay? Yeah. Um, there we go. Just like Rich said, once the tool is set, it's set. It'll kind of hang there by itself. We'll talk about that downstairs, pop the door open. Uh, rabbit tool, always be prepared to control the door. Okay, this is just a couple different options with the rabbit tool or a one-man hydraulic forceful entry tool. If I was by myself, a little bird pitch on your rabbit tool or your bunny tool, bird pitch the doorknob, and as I pop it, I can pull it shut. Um, just be aware when you pull that door shut, you probably relax it on yourself. But you know, um, you know, you have to look at the tool with you. So, um, so this is just an option if you're by yourself or or with a partner. Uh, hinge side. It's not the primary way to do it because we've lost integrity of the door and we lost control of ventilation. So if I've got to go to the hinge side, it's kind of a last resort. And certainly in high-rise buildings, you could have a high-rise, you could have a wind-driven fire here. If this building is the tallest one on the block and there's a 40, 50 mile power wind, and we take those windows and that's the upwind side, you could create a wind-driven fire in a two-story building, okay? Um, just be aware of that. So uh, ventilation is-, is I'll admit, uh, I haven't had much luck with hinge side. This is, this is intensive ball busting work when you have to break it. If you're lucky you get the heads to shear, great. It's getting the heads to shear. Whether you're putting a four pallet over, hitting it with a sledgehammer, rocking it left and right, you can still do all that and they may not shear. They may yeah. not. And even when they do shear, I still have to separate the door and the jam again. Yeah. And she still not for force it, but you have to open it. But this is a this is a metal door uh, in a metal frame. It, they have four to twenty screws. They're they're short and they're very fine thread. It's a coarse. It's a very fine fine metal thread. So if you take a sledgehammer at that hinge and smash it a couple times, it's going to start backing out like that before I even put the tool on. Um, depending on the occupancy, if it's a bank, it's going to be harder than than the the the, the, the uh, pet shop. But this then you slide that over and, and then rip them out. Uh, the middle one's not so hard. It's the the top hinge that's the hard one because now I have to. You know, you can take the sludge hammer and, and smash it up on this thing, try to loosen up. When I slide this tool up, you have to get behind the tool like this, and then it's it's all um, brute. It's, yeah, it's all like chest and shoulders, where this, I'm using my body weight to rip, rip them out. Wood doors are a little bit more challenging because the screws are longer and they're more coarse, so they, they really get a good bite on the wood. Probably come out of the door pretty quick, but this goes through the one by, depending on the length of the screw, it goes into a two by four or two two by fours. You know, if it's a three inch wood screw, that can be a little bit more challenging, but it's it's just another option. Let's say we cut those hinges with a saw. Even though I cut those hinges on metal doors and a lot of commercial structures, they have little pins in them now that prevent the hinges from coming apart so you just can't easily push the door. If you ever open some hinges on doors, you see there's two little tits that stick out. So when the hinges shut, they interlock to each other so that even though if you were to cut the hinges on the edge or it's coming over to the saw, I'm like, hey, let's just get in real quick. We'll just lock hinges, boom. Boom, boom, we'll get a two in there and make it pull apart. It won't. You're still going to get some separation in that hinge joint. The, the hinge still has to come out. So if you have that particular type of hinges, then again, that's going to depend on the occupancy. They're, they cost a little more. So if it's whatever, whatever kind of commercial occupancy is, if it's a little bit of a higher end, you can be assured that you know it's going to be more of a What's my way? Are you talk about my metal doors, Larry. Is there a doggy door that I cut low? Do I cut the hinges? Do I cut V's where the hinges are? Do I cut the third door and just get rid of it? There's options, options, options. Uh, we talked about the shoulders. Um, it's just another option. Um, some guys will take a, the tow bar, when you get it, it's rounded here. You can take that 90 out, put a 90 in it, and for diminished visibility or close quarters, it's just another striking surface uh, for, your, for your tool. So. If I could, I just want to make one more point though about the tool being set for inward opening. This is when the tool is set for inward opening. Um, here's the best way. The, here's how Stevie Wonder figures it out, right? This is the doorstop. It's hard to make out that line. The door was on that doorstop. It got pushed away a little bit. When the crotch of the tool is where the door was, the inside of the doorstop, the backside doesn't matter. The inside, okay, the tool is set. All right, and that's important. That's the most important thing with this, and that's what it looks like. How do we know it's set, or what is going on on the inside or the back side of this door? Well, now I've got my fulcrum. Now I can pry this door open. If the tool's not set and the fulcrum's not in place, the tool's gonna pop out. It's gonna pop out every time. It's physics, it's just, that's what happens. So, we kinda, you gotta kinda pump the brakes when you're doing this, make sure the tool's set. Once it's set, then we can go ahead and force the door. Until, until you're ready, it's, it's, it's probably not gonna happen. 
Cool. All right, guys, what we'll do now, ask that you fill out the CEQ if you haven't already. We're still going to do some hands-on stuff.